it's a great pleasure today to w welcome Adele Webb, uh, lecturer in politics and policy in the School of Justice at Queensland Institute, the University of Technology, uh, as well as adjunct research fellow at the Griffith Asia Institute. Uh, she will be giving a seminar today with the title Chasing Freedom, the Philippines' Long Journey to Democratic Ambivalence. And this uh, talk draws on Adele's book by the same title, which um, I'm pleased to show here. First published uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, but more recently has come out in paperback versions from Ateneo de Manila Press uh, in the Philippines. Um, Adele's research is in the areas of democratic theory, Southeast Asian politics, Philippine political history, post-colonialism, critical policy studies, and international development. She holds a PhD from the University of Sydney and a MSc in political sociology from the LSE. And alongside her academic work, uh, Adele maintains an active uh, profile in public engagement, provi providing commentary on Philippine politics and geopolitics for various news outlets and think tanks in Australia and overseas. So over to you. Uh, welcome. Thank uh, you. Great to have before, you there. before I get started, let me just um, share my screen. Uh, Okay, is that okay for everyone? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect, great. Thank you again, Paul, for that um, kind of introduction and for the kind of invitation. We might be able to minimize that. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. that little one. That's true. Single line. Single line. Sorry. Yeah, look to more down here and we get the strip at the bottom too. Okay. 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 Um, and thank you for the kind invitation to um, speak today. It's a great honour. Um, as Paul said to me, I, I want to talk largely from my book, um, which was published this year. Um, but what I've done is sort of divided. There we go. Good. Uh, oh. Okay, Good. we'll get there. Um, divided the talk into three parts. First, I just want to give a, a brief um, bit of context around the research and how I came to be asking the kind of questions that I was asking. Um, second, to take the, the bulk of the time really to try succinctly to take you on the journey that I um, cover in the book illuminating hopefully the central arguments and the evidence that are used to make those arguments. And finally, to draw out um, some of its contributions and in particular to talk um, more about the concept at the centre of the book, which is democratic ambivalence. So I'm sure this is um, not news to anyone, but the Philippines is um, a really fascinating country and especially if you're interested in international politics, it's a country that's been caught up between rival empires for almost five centuries, subject, of course, to iterations of imperial rule from the Spanish, the Americans, the Japanese, and today, of course, at the centre of a delicate dance or at times not so delicate dance between China and the US, especially in the South China or West Philippine Sea. The title of Asia's oldest democracy gets thrown around a lot but so does its inclusion as a new democracy in the third wave literature following the 86th uprising that ended the Marcos reign. These two rather asynchronous attributions, I think, hint at some of the ambiguity and even contradictions in the way the country's journey with democracy has been and continues to be conveyed in the general commentary and in the political science literature in particular. Um, I was introduced to the kind of paradoxes um, and wonders of the Philippines, um, not through academic articles or books, but through a personal experience. Um, my first visit was in 2010 when I volunteered in an organisation based in Manila that was helping to produce radio editorials um, about voting and good governance and democracy, et cetera, in the lead up to the election. And I also managed to get myself um, accredited as an international election observer and went down to Negros 
to Bakoad City and was observing in a nearby, nearby small community called Pulapangan on election day. And there are many things that I could say about what I saw and learned and puzzled over during that period, um, too much for today. I need to say that it left me um, intrigued about the obstacles to a more transformative politics in the country, um, beyond explanations of weak institutions, um, and certainly beyond insinuations about naivety or cognitive unsophistication in the ways of democracy, things that I found implicitly and explicitly in the democratization literature. I also became interested in the role of the middle class. After all, these were my friends and colleagues in the middle class. And while I knew we shared lots of views in common, there were some perspectives and some tropes that I didn't understand. And for all the lip service to the um, complexities of democratic trajectories, the middle class is still presumed as a kind of temperature gauge for democratic health. This no longer reflects the empirical reality, however, for middle classes globally have found themselves at the centre of conversations and debates about um, democracy in crisis. But I came to ask, um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, let me carry on. The foreign affairs um, analyst Joshua Kalansi said in his 2013 book on democratic backsliding in the developing world that few middle classes have failed to emulate the predictions of modernization theory as dramatically as in the Philippines. And I think there is um, quite a lot of truth to that. But I came to ask, should the emphasis here be on the failure of the Philippine middle class to act as they should, or should the emphasis here be on the normative assumptions that we still hold about the quality of the relationship between middle class and democracy? And finally, I was perturbed and irritated by the binary way that democratic attitudes were predominantly understood using survey data to describe individuals as either in favour of democratic government or against it. This seemed an, analytic, an, an inadequate analytical frame to capture the complexities of political beliefs and orientations. Is unequivocal support for democracy even realistic, I thought. This leads, of course, to the concept at the centre of the book, democratic ambivalence, uh, which I'll talk about in more detail later, but it's also a good time to turn uh, to the argument in the book. So when I began my fieldwork interviews for this project in June 2015 uh, with middle-class respondents, Rodrigo Giderte was really mentioned in national public discourse. But as the months continued and the prospect of his candidacy for presidency, president became more likely, it was increasingly to comment to hear discussions considering his credentials as a local politician, his track record in Davao, and what a Jadote presidency might mean for the nation's future. Many people at the moment are abusing their freedom and doing things which are not good, said one of my interviewees. But we have this one politician, Jadote, whose type of leadership is like Marcos, and many people like that. And if you see Davao right now, it is one of the safest places in the Philippines. For me, if that type of leadership is implemented again, I think it's much better. During the various extended periods I'd spent living in Metro Manila, I'd become accustomed to hearing the sentiment that Philippines, Filipinos are undisciplined. Filipinos don't follow rules, especially when driving. But as I began to interview middle class participants for the study, most of whom were to some extent politically engaged, I didn't expect to hear the same sentiments. There's too much freedom, one of my interviewees chuckled in a throwaway remark. She was a lawyer and a human rights activist in her 30s. Freedom was the way my respondents encapsulated the image of democracy, but freedom, they were telling me, had become the problem. Repeatedly at the heart of beliefs I heard expressed about democracy, I found a contradictory adage. The Philippines is a freedom-loving country, but in the Philippines, freedom needs restraint. Or to paraphrase the sentiment another way, democracy is good, <coughs> but too much democracy can be dangerous in the Philippines. These ideas around democracy as freedom and both the love of and fear of that notion are at the descriptive heart of what I identify as democratic ambivalence within the Philippine middle class. 
Democratic ambivalence I define as a synchronous and sustained holding of conflicting feelings about democracy. A saying of yes and no that is not transient or temporary, but stable and persistent. It is an empirical reality for which existing political science research has both little tolerance and little understanding. But these narrative accounts from my respondents are not the only place these contradictions can be found. One only needs to look to responses in the World Value Survey. Um, in the most recent wave, 2019, 66% of the university educated respondents expressed simultaneous support for a democratic political system as preferable and a strong leader who does not have to bother with Congress and elections. And as you can see from the table, over the past quarter of a century since the World Value Survey has been collecting data in the Philippines, more than 50% of university educated Filipinos have expressed ambivalent views when it comes to democratic governments. While this level of ambivalence holds across all social classes, the fact that it is strongly present in the subset of highly educated respondents runs counter to what orthodox democratization, democratization theory would expect us to find, that the higher someone's socioeconomic status the more likely they are to adopt emancipatory values, which in turn translates into an uncompromised demand for democracy. And so I'm satisfied to leave this as some kind of flawed democratic agency or as a characteristic of an uncivilized political culture. I undertook to do a genealogy of this ambivalence to trace where it, where it came from. What I found was that rather than a contemporary phenomenon or even a lingering remnant of authoritarian nostalgia from the Marcos days, the synchronous saying of yes and no to democratic politics has been one of the most defining features of the middle class's democratic journey. That demonstrably since at least the 1940s, carried within a middle class demand for democracy has been a coexisting desire for equality and freedom on the one hand, and an inclination toward hierarchy and restraint on the other. The primary source of this double-sided response to democracy, I argue, can be traced back to the conditions of duress under which America's project of colonial democracy or democratic tutelage was introduced to the country at the turn of the last century. So the book is divided into three parts and the chapters construct a broadly temporal genealogy of middle class ambivalence, starting in the last decades of the 19th century when the economic, social and technological innovations underway in the late Spanish Philippines had precipitated not only structural changes, but a period of civic flourishing. Recent historical works of the late 19th century period confirm the important political and ideational role played by members of a nascent middle class during these revolutionary times. These findings are crucial as they demonstrate that the starting point for studying the consciousness of the middle class lies much earlier than existing studies so they suggest. The Philippine Revolution against Spain, begun in 1896, had all but forced Spanish authorities from the island, bar a fleet of ships in Manila Bay, yet the independ independence movement was interrupted and ultimately quashed by the entry of American forces, beginning a new era of colonialism that lasted until the end of the Second World War. Building on existing critical American studies, the first part of the book brings to light the nature of the US Philippine encounter beyond a territorial intervention and colonial occupation as an exercise of, exercise of implicit domination, characterized by a complex of democratic idealism and brutalizing means. It is the fundamentally contradictory nature of this polysemic empire and the cacophony, cacophony of rhetorical alibis used to establish its position of authority that the first part of the book brings to the fore. It details the way the violence and subjugation that underwrote US colonial policy was sustained by a deeply contradictory logic by which American officials claimed that the protection of Filipino liberties necessitated the indefinite denial of their liberty. Colonial representations rendering Filipinos as savages in need of guidance, tutoring and uplifting, legitimise the denial of Philippine agency. At the same time, this very denial of agency presupposed America's mandate to act. It made it possible or even necessary to ignore, silence or forcefully repress Filipino attempts to exercise agency 
and framed all such policy decisions and practices as acts of deliverance and salvation. Compliance with colonial structures of power, however subjugating and violent, became equated with the behaviour required of the good student of democracy. To demonstrate a readiness for self-government was to accept discipline and domination. Daring to question the, the, the situation or advocate independence, subjected Filipinos to accusations of being anything from mischievous, obnoxious and ungrateful, to bandits, rebels and conspirators, or simply too ignorant to comprehend what was in their best interests. It is the inability of the common people to understand what is in their own interest that justifies our remaining here, said William Taft. So having set out the oriental, on Orientalism and epistemic violence embedded within the American imperial architecture, the second part of the book turns to the Philippines' experience of the colonial democracy paradox from the late 19th century <coughs> to the early 1950s. Rather than subsume decades of history into a simple narrative of middle-class integration and collaboration with the American colonial regime, I demonstrate the way the middle class's response was far from straightforward, a straightforward story of passive reception and reproduction of elite frames. This section tries to amplify the voices of middle class actors as early as 1910 in what can only be described as open and candid middle class rejections of the US's sanctimonious posturing in professing to teach Filipinos about democracy. Far from simple quiescence, these bourgeois actors asserted strong criticism of specific policies being introduced under the auspices of democratic tutelage. They challenged the contradictions and anomalies they saw around them and were unwilling to concede to the defamation of Filipinos' subjectivity and character implicit in, the America's, in America's colonial project. By the 1920s, when for most the memory of the Philippine-American War had significantly faded, the relationship of the Philippine middle class to its coloniser took on a new shape. The growing middle class, many of whom were employed in various facets of the colonial bureaucracy, became the primary beneficiaries of an English language colonial education system, one goal of which was the intensive Americanization of its Filipino students. As the corruption and chicanery of the Philippine political elite increased, learning to manipulate as they did the constraints of participation in the colonial system to their advantage, the culprit became more difficult to identify. Was the US to blame for the Philippines' lack of independence or was it the immorality of the political class? Through an imported American framework, it was the local elite who appeared the chief concern, given that the central message was that democratic freedoms were conditional upon the performance of dutiful citizenship and moral probity. Under the surface, however, there still ran an undercurrent of resentment to American sovereignty, which from time to time erupted in indignation, movements of nationalist spirit, and in bold acts of refusing to abide colonial subjugation. On, on the 2nd of February 1930, for example, a National Humiliation Day was observed in response to the murder of a young Filipino farm worker during bloody riots targeting Filipinos in California. News of the killing was condemned by the Philippines government, business leaders, students, and tens of thousands of ordinary people turned out to peacefully protest against this act of racial degradation and to demand the immediate emancip emancipation of the islands. The incident would be the trigger of the Sactivista movement, perhaps the most significant attempt by middle-class Filipinos during this era to participate in and influence elite-controlled domestic politics. But the demise of the Sactivista movement would also reveal the complex position in which middle-class actors found themselves, constrained by the very colonial order that nourished their de democratic aspirations. Caught between the desire to pursue these aspirations and the fear of drawing the ire of Washington and sabotaging the chance to truly be free. For their part, the Philippine political class well and truly adapted to the situation, becoming masters of double talk. By the 1930s, the rhetorical practices of the Philippine elite had come to mirror the strategies of colonial governments. The use of imperial tools of exemption and exception by which sections of the population are differentiated from the rest, defined as exempt from democratic principles, 
making way for the creation of spaces where the use of exceptional power was deemed legitimate. The book then moves on to focus on the early independence period. And it demonstrates the way the post-colonial Philippine society continued to negotiate the moral and political entanglements of the colonial era. I do this principally through a close reading of the discourse in the Philippine Free Press news magazine over a five-year period from January 46 to December 1950. The Free Press was the country's most prominent English language weekly newspaper with a national and predominantly middle-class readership. Employing a discursive practices approach, which I borrow from critical policy studies and critical IR, the analysis uncovers an internalization of the constraints of the colonial order, not only through the reification of an asymmetrical relationship between the US and the Philippines, but through the continuing nurturing of a deep sense of anxiety and self-doubt. For example, these tables show the descriptive characteristics I extracted from texts in the paper that were attributed to the American and Filipino subjects. But of course, here's a table that you can actually read. Here's a, um, just a sample of them, um, just to give you an idea. These descriptors or predicates which I extracted hang together in a clear way, suggesting an, a, a coherence and shared logic that formed the dominant public discourse at the time. This coherence extended over both the stark authored um, cover stories and editorials that I analysed, as well as the letters, poems, essays, etc., that were sent in by middle class readers and republished by the paper. To give you another flavour of what I found in the free press. This is the cartoon that featured on the front page of the paper in July 1947 to commemorate the first an anniversary of the grant of independence. It reinforces the metaphor of the relationship of the US Philippines as that between a parent and child. The caption read, and what now little man, going it alone, legs a bit shaky and steps a bit uncertain, but getting along, head in the right direction and hand tightly gripping the flag. The deeper the political crisis that emerged in the country during these early post-colonial, post-independence years, the more it seemed to reflect not only on the innately corrupt character of local politicians, but on the foolishness of Filipino voters, a narrative that continued to reinforce the colonial construction of the inferior Filipino subject, incapable of self-government. Every report of government wrongdoing was experienced as a personal defamation and a loss of esteem, not only in the eyes of Americans, but the whole world. Our national soul, wrote, wrote journalist Melchor Aquino, can only be as good as that of our citizenry, in the same way that our government can only be as good as the people, the people make it. Bitter as the truth may be, our national soul and our government are floundering in the morass of moral bankruptcy. This tragedy is our people's own doing. This imaginary manifested itself in material politics until ultimately by 1950, the public's growing loss of faith in democracy would allow a renewed period of American intervention, including a military-led counterinsurgency against peasant uprisings. When US officials wanted to replace the failing presidency of Perino with their chosen candidate, Ramon Magsaysay, they thought it would require acting by sleuth through their CIA operatives but in fact, they didn't need to worry about concealment. In 1950, the front page of the free press reflected on the prospect of renewed intervention into the Philippines affairs by the US and the complaints from some quarters about strings attached. The Philippines is a sick man, anemic, emancipated and enfeebled in urgent need of a blood transfusion. Our good seemingly ever accommodating Uncle Sam has again demonstrated his genuinely altruistic spirit by sharing what may be called his life's blood to save the prostate beyond. But Uncle Sam reserves the right to say, who shall superintend or perform the transfer operation? So the third and final part of the book seeks to reframe the events of the contemporary Philippines from the 1960s until the, until the present 
through this lens of the past. And it argues that the ambivalence embedded in the middle class democratic imaginary helps to make sense of a period that's marked by striking paradoxes and oscillations towards and away from democratic politics. First, this means exploring the way the pursuit of freedom and a fulfillment of democratic promises in the post-colonial context made imperative the need for a revolutionary break with the past. And yet how this desire for metamorphosis carried within it opposing impulses, an anti-imperialism that demanded dignity and autonomy, along with continuing anxiety and doubt about the capacity of, demo capacity of democracy to transform society in a meaningful way and about the capacity of the Filipino subject to behave in a way fitting with democracy. My striking, of course, was the culmination of this ambivalent sentiment in the broad middle class support or at least acquiescence to Ferdinand Marcos's assumption of total power. Marcos's legitimacy was helped, no doubt, by the fact the early 1970s were boom years for the export of Philippine commodities, but penetrating more deeply was the way the president played on the lingering frustrations and anxieties that nurtured the middle class's ambivalence about democracy. The democratic impasse in the country seemed terminal, so impenetrable had the oligarchic political state become the governments of the day seemed unable or unwilling to absorb the democratic demands of citizens. The resulting accumulation of unfulfilled aspirations meant that the only hope for change, it seemed, was through radical measures. What is more, it wasn't only the chronic misbehaviour of the political elite, but the sense of crime, lawlessness and disorder, including the increasing revolt of Marcos's opponents, that once again inflamed anxiety amongst the broad middle class about the Philippine, Filipinos' innate propensity for vice and the capacity of Filipino citizens to behave in a way of freedom democracy. Significant to note, however, is the fact that middle-class support for Marcos's imposition of Marcos' martial law, or at least their acquiescence to it, was in many cases a negotiated response, mediating deeply valued democratic aspirations and the experiences of everyday life. As Javita Salonga, a high profile lawyer, recalled in his memoir about this time, the bombings in the Greater Manila area suddenly stopped. Peace and order promptly descended upon Manila and its environs to the satisfaction of citizenry. There were no people in the streets at night because of the curfew. Mothers and housewives obviously welcomed martial law. In a matter of a few days, the streets were cleaner and scores of young men who had been arrested for one misdemeanor or another were made to do some kind of community service. Western-style democracy would not do. Marcos, people believed, was the strong hand of discipline needed to bring things to order. His propaganda promised to restore the once grand and dignified Filipino subject who had been compromised by a colonial past, replacing the sick old society with a new one. In September 1972, having jailed his rivals, key opponents and critics in the media, he made the popular proclamation of martial law, saying it was being done to protect the Philippines and our democracy. He claimed to be resolving the colonial condition by imposing the very constraints that were central to it. It was a governing logic based on arbitrary power imposed in the name of democracy. A twisted logic the country knew all too well from its history. The only democratic aspirations acceptable were those quiescent to the regime. If this is beginning to sound familiar to those first in recent dynamics, that is because Rodrigo Duterte played a very similar card with a nationalist populism that imbued the Philippine nation and people with dignity and esteem, that acknowledged the failures of democratic politics to transform society, and that promised to impose a strong hand to keep wayward Filipinos, wayward Filipino subject the one believed innately prone to vice on the straight and narrow. But of course, in jumping from the 1970s to 2016, we've missed a fundamental episode in Philippine political history, almost certainly the most cited one when it comes to talk of democracy, the people power protests that forced Marcos and his family to flee the country. That the Philippines was not captive to the same enduring authoritarianism as many of its regional neighbours was one of the most striking lessons of this era. It confirmed, I argue, the ongoing presence of an ambivalence toward power sharing government. For the same two-sided response to democracy that led large segments of the middle class to support or at least acquiesce to Marcos 
was also at the root of their determination just over a decade later to cut the dictator's authority off at the knees and restore a democratic mode of rule. Yeah. <laughs> do what I do, just press the reminder later. Exactly. <laughs> Much meaning has been imputed on the events of February 1986. Democratization discourses from outside heralded it as a tangible expression of the third wave sweeping the developing world. And in the language of regime transition, this was the moment the Philippines um, moved from an authoritarian system of government to a democratic one. But these teleological discourses failed to understand the complexity of the moment that it was embedded in a long history that wasn't defined by its singular coherence, but by its oscillations towards and away from democracy. The argument I make in the final chapter of the book is that the Etza revolution itself and the people power trope that emerged from it had and continues to have such resonance and efficacy, not because it signaled the end of democratic ambivalence, but because it accommodated and encompassed it. On the one hand, it's a symbolised liberation of the nation from the indignity and suffering under oppressive power. Crowded together on the street, people repeatedly sang together by and called a song that calls for the liberation of an oppressed homeland. Marcos, his iron fist rule and economic malfeasance had become the cause of the collective suffering from which the Philippines ultimately needed to be delivered. But alongside the theme of national redemption was the redemption of the inferior Filipino subject, which spearheaded by an enlightened middle class had finally proven itself worthy of democracy. The humiliating image of the Filipino subject of dubious democratic character and prone to vice had been displaced, displaced by the new image of a righteous people against a corrupt dictatorial regime. But viewing, but viewing events through the frame of morality failed to resolve the anxiety about the, the Filipino susceptibility to vice. To the contrary, it made way for the proposition that the dark past of the Marcos years was the result of the Filipino subject, subject's moral ineptitude and that failures to come were also. The root of the crisis facing the Filipinos in the last two or three decades, wrote an academic from Ateneo at the time, was moral in nature. Looking forward after the February events, he claimed that the paramount, of paramount importance was the moral reconstruction of the Filipino character. The framing of Etza as a miracle of God and as a deliverance by divine intervention, as became embedded in the popular narrative of the middle class, only confirmed the belief in a fragile and contingent relationship between politics and morality. After Etza, Cory Aquino, one of my interviewees, explained, they tried to restore freedom. Now there's too much freedom. Sad to say, said another, a lawyer in his 40s, we don't have that moral compass yet. We don't have that strict freedom in our hearts. Events of the, decade, of the decades following Edsel 1, including the episodes of People Power 2 and 3, would demonstrate that the antagonism at its core between the desire for freedom and the perceived need for restraint would remain in salient truth that imperial recursions would remain the close companion of democratic aspiration. On the one hand, the governing logic of Marcos would continue to rear its head, that the old society must first be overcome before democracy can reign. At the same time, the image of the damaged and humiliated colonial Filipino subject of history continued to fuel the national struggle for true independence and true autonomy. Such that in 2016, when Dodote infamously cursed Obama and told him to mind his own business about human rights, though deemed bad behaviour by the rest of the world at home, his subversiveness had great appeal. The more his erratic and undisciplined behaviour drew the disapproval of an international crowd, the more compelling to many was his leadership. Why? Because he embodied the scrutinised Filipino native subject of history subordinated, looked down upon by the foreign outsider. In standing up for the people, he signified a refusal to continue the indignity of the past. Of course, we could and we should um, talk about the most recent election of Ferdinand Bonbon Marcos Jr., although it's not included in the 
for the story of ambivalence and of the mobilization by elites of potent nationalist narratives continues. And I'm happy to explore this further um, in the question time. But I want to finish today with some reflection on the some reflections on the contribution of the book and also return to this concept of democratic ambivalence. So first on the empirical story, the long journey. I have suggested that rather than capricious and green when it comes to the workings of democracy, the contemporary middle class in the Philippines derives its outlook on democratic politics from a conciliation of the democratic ideal with the lived experience of its practice. An outlook shaped by historical experience that deems democracy to be both the ultimate goal of the Filipino people and a danger to their hopes of stability and progress. It is this deep-seated ambivalence that best explains the middle class's simultaneous support for self-government and their intermittent tolerance for top-down rule. In retelling the story of the Philippines' journey with democracy through a colonial genealogy of middle-class ambivalence, the study also offers, I hope, a fresh take on the epistemic legacies of the American imperialism in the islands. Beware our historically truncated optics in the study of contemporary politics, it warns. For imperial legacies are not only durable, but they, they hitch a ride into the present, embedded in language, knowledge and subjectivities in ways we might not have adequately considered. It also rebuts the conventional narrative about a historically quiescent middle class demonstrating that the starting point for studying the significance of middle-class political beliefs and behaviours lies much earlier. Second, what to make of an ambivalent middle-class? Beyond the specifics of the Philippine case, the study raises questions about the analytical framework conventionally used, conventionally used to understand the qualitative relationship between middle-classes and democracy. The middle-classes will not always be shock absorbers against all forms of despotism. See China and Russia for the most obvious examples. The emphasis in this study has been on the mediated and negotiated nature of middle class democratic attitudes. It demonstrates that the formation of a middle class political consciousness is a complex and protracted process shaped by the context of political transition. The Philippine story also demonstrates the need to put studies of middle classes in a geopolitical frame in order to bring to light the way, as I mentioned above, that colonial histories traverse temporal boundaries of the past and continue to shape political identities into the present for the colonised and the colonisers. But perhaps the most significant outcome of the book is the development of the concept of democratic ambivalence. Democratic ambivalence implies a withholding of permanent support for democracy. It captures the way that democratic dispositions can be durably durably inhabited by forces that simultaneously work with and against democracy. Most of the existing democracy literature relies on the normative assumption that citizens and middle class citizens in particular take a journey toward unequivocal commitment to democracy. Inconsistencies or irregularities in political beliefs, such as the case when people favour democracy yet fail to denounce authoritarian governments, are derided as ignorant and confused, dangerous or preliminary. Here the relationship between ambivalence and democracy is entirely reframed. The conceptualization developed in the book makes the case that ambivalence is not a pathology of democracy, but rather a product of people living democratically. More than that, I make a normative defense of ambivalence, arguing that it needs to be accommodated into our expectations of how democracy works. Ambivalence, ambivalence has two sources in democracy, I argue. On the one hand, ambivalence is produced by the fact the lived reality of democracy never meets the grand idea. Democracy promises something it can never fully deliver. It begets disappointments, frustrations and despondency. Ambivalence then is an inevitable byproduct of the messy realities of de democracy in practice. The second source of ambivalence is the grand ideal itself. The principle of democracy rests on the premise that although paradise on earth is never realised, efforts to correct, improve and innovate are always possible. Democracy as a political form is defined by its acknowledgement of failure, distinguished from monarchy and dictatorship by the permanent possibility of change. 
the ability to question power makes democracy peculiarly vulnerable, not only to charges of hypocrisy and imperfection, but to feelings of disappointment and disgruntlement. It keeps open the possibility of radical transformation and nurtures imaginings and hopes of alternative visions, in so doing awakening and ambivalence with the present. This gets to the heart of the theoretical proposition in the book, that ambivalence is not only a mediated response to democracy, but a necessary one, an internal safeguard that resists the type of certainty that might lead to totalizing ideologies in favour of a permanent state, permanent state of contemplation and watchfulness. What does this mean about the Philippine story? Well, in the case of the Philippines, I contend that ambivalence is not a case of failed agency, but a rational, deliberate and non-silent expression of constitutional power. It is a down-to-earth, pragmatic approach to a situation in which democracy is both a venerated ideal and a misused rhetoric. It is at times perhaps the only way to stay in the game without giving up entirely. Ambivalence has enabled citizens to recognise that what has been labelled as democracy, whether by a colonial authority or a political elite, is in fact a lullaby, mere rhetoric that inoculates the worst of hypocrites and talks of injustice. But the applicability of the concept goes well beyond the Philippine case. In an age of geographical, geographically vast disenchantment with existing democracy, the journey might teach us things of global importance. How do we habituate our studies of democratic attitudes and beliefs to the permanent gap that exists between political aspirations, visions and promises propagated by an ideal on the one hand and the real life world constraints of the practice of democracy on the other? By acknowledging ambivalence as one of democracy's travelling companions, I argue. A roomy that, though it might sometimes smell or wake us up in the middle of the night, just won't go away no matter how hard or how much we wish for it to do so. Of course, there are caveats. In particular, the relationship between ambivalence and populism is an important one, very evident in the Philippine journey that I deal with further in the conclusion of the book. Democratic ambivalence is promiscuous, and that's difficult for us to accept. But to disparage ambivalence and in its place to make attempts at bringing certainty to democratic politics is in the words of political theorist Nadia Ovenati, to disfigure democracy. Well, not only does this remove from people the agency and volition enshrined in democratic politics, it denies the fact that democracy is and always will be both an aspirational ideal and a perceived reality. Returning to the Philippines as I close, it remains to be seen whether the ambivalence of the middle class can find a more down to earth, plain speaking, humble iteration of democratic politics in which to take shelter one that doesn't provoke such extremes. We haven't seen it yet. Perhaps Annie Roberto's presidential run was the closest thing to it. And the fact that though she lost, she ran the way she did and stood for the things she did is in the long view more significant than we realise. Whatever the future may hold, I hope my small contribution to the study of the colourful politics of the Philippines helps to challenge criticisms of ambivalence, diverting attention instead to its imperial roots and sparing its contemporary carriers yet more foreign indignation and exasperation. Thank you.